We now come in our study of salvation to the doctrine of the atonement of Jesus Christ. We covered in our previous two lessons the fact that salvation is God's intention. It originated with God. And then we went through the theories of salvation and discovered the biblical theory, which is the Bible truth of the evangelical belief that a person must trust Jesus Christ as his personal Savior, belief in the gospel, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and that he was buried and that he rose again from the dead the third day according to the scriptures. The Bible says, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So we come really now to the foundation of salvation, which is the atonement of Jesus Christ. Belief in the gospel, of course, is necessary, but if the gospel message is no good, or if the ground upon which the gospel message stands is no good, then, of course, the entire structure will fall. So the atonement of Jesus Christ is what we're going to study, the biblical nature of the atonement in both Old and New Testaments, as far as the word atonement is concerned. And then what we're going to do is look at the theological ideas behind the atonement of Christ, and then the Bible truths of the atonement of Jesus Christ. Um, if you'll notice this word, atonement, you'll see two words, at one. So you have at one meant. So the idea is reconciliation, to bring two opposing parties together. And that's what the word itself, the etymology of the word, means. Now, the word atonement appears 80 times in your King James Bible. It occurs 79 times in the Old Testament and one time in the New Testament. Now, let's look over in the book of Leviticus, Leviticus chapter number 4, and let's notice how the word atonement is used and what it's connected to. When you study the Bible, the best way to learn the Bible is not necessarily to grab dictionaries and commentaries and writings of men to try to explain it. One of the best ways to understand the Bible is to take the Bible itself and let the scriptures define themselves by way of word comparisons and there will be certain words in the same verses that will help you gain an understanding. And here we find Leviticus chapter number 4 we'll find the word atonement used along with the word forgiveness. Look in Leviticus chapter number 4 Come down to verse number 19. This is obviously the Old Testament sacrificial system here. And the priest um, is doing the sacrifice. Verse 19, He shall take all of his fat from him and burn it upon the altar. And he shall do with the bullock as he did with the bullock for a sin offering. So shall he do with this. And the priest shall make an atonement for them. And it shall be forgiven them. You'll see that same thing repeated. Look down in verse 26, the end of the passage. The priest shall make an atonement for him as concerning his sin, and it shall be forgiven him. The same thing. Look down in verse 31. The priest shall make an atonement for him. It shall be forgiven him. One more time, verse number 35. The priest shall make an atonement for him that sinned that he hath committed, and it shall be forgiven now come over to Leviticus chapter 16, and we'll notice here is what we have in the Scripture as far as the feast days with the nation of Israel. This is called the Day of Atonement, Leviticus chapter number 16. And what you had with the Old Testament feasts, you had seven feasts divided up into four and three, and the last three feasts took place in the seventh month. In Leviticus chapter 16, we have material given about how the priests were to order and take care of the sacrifices for the Day of Atonement. The Day of Atonement is called Yom Kippur. And Yom means day and Kippur means to cover. And that is really the, um, the beginning of the civil year, if you will. The religious year begins at Passover for the Jews. The civil year begins with the, uh, the Day of Atonement. And so we have, uh, I say a Day of Atonement, but really you have... Leviticus 16, verse 29, it's the tenth day. The first day is, the first day of the seventh month is um, Rosh Hashanah, which is the head of the year. So that's the beginning of the civil year. Ten days later, you have the beginning 
which mar is marked by the Day of Atonement here. Leviticus chapter number 16, come down if you will to verse number 21. Leviticus 16, look in verse 21. And Aaron shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat, and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel, and all their transgressions, and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat, and shall send him away by the hand of a fit man into the wilderness. What we have here is the idea of a transference of guilt. Now when you read Leviticus 16, he has two different um, goats here. One goat obviously has to be offered as a sin offering. And then he also has a bullock that he takes into the holy place with the blood and puts the blood on the uh, mercy seat. But you have the two goats. One goat, there's the sins that are transferred from the high priest over to the head of that goat. And then that goat is sent out into the wilderness, into a land not inhabited. Kind of like the passage where he says your, your sins are removed as far as the east is from the west. Kind of like the fact that the Bible says Christ bore our sins and, um, and he took our sins away. And so that's the idea is that, our, that sins have been transferred to this animal by way of atonement. Now when you, and if you come over to Leviticus chapter 6, keep your hand there and we may come back to Leviticus 16, but look over in chapter 6. I'm just trying to give you some words. We have forgiveness, we have a transference of guilt, and then we have, look in Leviticus chapter 6, verse number 30. Look at this word, and I mentioned it up here. Leviticus chapter 6, when I gave you the word atonement, at one, it has to do with this word. Leviticus chapter 6, look in verse 30. And no sin offering whereof any of the blood is brought into the tabernacle of the congregation to reconcile with all in the holy place shall be eaten. It shall be burnt in the fire. Notice that word reconcile. To bring two opposing parties together. The sinner is reconciled to God by way of blood atonement. And the Bible tells us in Leviticus chapter 17, the life of the flesh is in the blood, verse number 11, Leviticus 17, 11, I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Now come over to Romans chapter 5 in the New Testament. Here's the only occurrence we have of the word atonement in the New, New Testament. Romans chapter number 5. And then we're going to look in Hebrews chapter 10. Romans chapter number 5. Come down, if you will, to verse number 11. The only occurrence in the New Testament, of course, it has to do with Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5 and verse 11. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. So we have received a covering. We've received a reconciliation. We've received... Um, a transference of our guilt off of us onto Him, and we have received forgiveness. The concept of atonement was well established in the Old Testament before these words were written here in the New Testament. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter number 10. I want to give you this before we get into the main part of our lesson. Hebrews chapter 10, it draws a comparison between the Old Testament sacrifices and what they could not do because really it's just the blood of, of animals and the New Testament sacrifice of Jesus Christ and what His sacrifice did do for us. Look in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter number 10, verse number 1. For the law having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices there is a remembrance again made of sins every year, for it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Okay, so the Old Testament laid out the feast days, like I told you, and you have the first day of the seventh month, which is Rosh Hashanah, the first day of the civil year. Then we have the tenth day of that seventh month is Yom Kippur, the day of covering, the day of atonement. And every year they had that, those feasts. The fifteenth day of that month is what we call the Feast of Tabernacles. But you had every year when the priest would go in and he would make a generalized 
atonement for the entire nation, not just individual sins where people would come and bring an offering, or when certain things happened, then they were required to bring offerings according to the feast days or different things that happened. But the Day of Atonement was for the entire nation. And that had to happen every year because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away sin. Keep your hand in Hebrews. We'll read the rest of it. But come over to Exodus 34 real quick. I want you to understand the difference between redemption under the New Testament of Jesus Christ and redemption as far as an Old Testament concept. The idea of an atonement or a covering or even forgiveness in the Old Testament is different than it is with the New Testament believer in this dispensation. And the reason I say that, Exodus 34, the reason I say that is because the blood of bulls and goats could not take away the sins of the people. Therefore, their conscience would still bother them. They're thinking, okay, I got, I got forgiven, or we as a nation got forgiveness. But boy, we sure have messed up now. What's going to happen to us? For the New Testament believer, once you put your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are remitted. They're gone. They're removed. They're absolved. They're forgiven. All trespasses. That's a huge difference. Now notice the term used here in Exodus 34. This is when the Lord reveals himself to Moses. He descends in verses 5 and 6, proclaims his name. And I like verse number 6. The first thing the Lord says about himself is that he's merciful. Thank God for that. Merciful, gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth. Verse 7, here it is. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin and that will by no means clear the guilty. Okay, so it says he can by no means clear the guilty. Now that's Old Testament. God cannot just clear sin. He could forgive, but you have to understand the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away their sin. It made atonement. There was a covering, and God forgave. Big difference in Old Testament and New Testament salvation and the big difference between the Old Testament and New Testament idea of atonement. Come back to Hebrews chapter number 10. Hebrews chapter number 10. Come down to verse number 8. 5, 6, and 7 describes Jesus Christ as the sacrifice. His body is pre pre prepared as the sacrifice. Verse number 6. God didn't have any pleasure in those sacrifices because they could not take away sin. Verse 8. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first that he may establish the second. The Old Testament did not take away sin. So the Old Testament is removed so the New Testament can be instituted. Remember when Christ in Matthew 26 sat around with the disciples and he instituted the New Testament by passing along the cup and the, Jew, and, the, uh, and the bread. So the first is taken away that he may establish the second. Verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. Look at this, once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. So that is the atonement of Jesus Christ and how it completes the sacrifice that God has intended for man's sins to be removed. Now let's look at theological ideas and then biblical truths. In other words, theological ideas, men have come up with ideas about the atonement. They've postulated on some things about what the atonement means, implications of the atonement and things like that. And I just want to give you these so you'll be familiar with them. Like I told you before, we don't study theology in order to learn necessarily the Bible. We study it just so we can understand some of the terms and things that are out there in the Christian community. You'll hear some of these phrases and terms, or may, maybe you even talk with someone and they have some of these concepts, even though they may not know these terms. The first one that we have is called the ransom theory of the atonement. And some of these theories are going to have some validity. Some of these theories are going to have partial truths to them. Some of these theories are going to have some Bible that would back it up and uh, collaborate 
And some of these theories are going to be just way off base. The whole foundation and everything about the theories will be wrong. These are just a few of these. The ransom theory was first advocated by a guy named Origen, and he was an apostate back uh, before uh, Christ came on the scene, about 185 to 254. Um, not before Christ came on the scene, 185 to 254 A.D. And Origen was down in Alexandria, Egypt, which I'm sure you've heard of Alexandria, the great libraries and so forth down in that area. And he was basically a uh, collator of scripture and philosophy, and he had a lot of weird and crazy ideas. And he came up with this idea, or pr promoted it, I should say, that Christ's death was paid to Satan to purchase humans. In other words, Satan released the hold on humans only to discover that he could not take the hold on Christ and Jesus Christ rose from the dead and he escaped hell and of course Satan lost. Now this is not without a few verses of scripture. 1 Timothy 2.6 the Bible says Christ gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Mark 10, 45, even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. So the word ransom is used, but you don't want to buy into this idea that you have this thing going between God and the devil, and the devil gets the blood of Christ paid to him as a ransom to let everybody free. There's no scriptures that teach that. But that's called the ransom theory of the atonement. Uh, the next one that we'll look at is called the moral example. Moral example of the atonement. And if you remember our last study when we talked about Pelagius, who lived around um, 354 to 420, Pelagius was the, the guy that came up with the idea that Christ's life is for us to follow as an example. It, hence you see the word example in this theory. And he said that we're all born just like Adam was and then we have to fight our own battles to find out whether we can attain salvation or not. So that theory of having self-salvation, autosoterism, kind of goes to uh, Pelagianism from Pelagius. And Pelagius taught that Christ's death provided an example of faith and obedience that inspires others to be obedient to God. And of course, there's a verse that seemingly goes along with this, 1 Peter 2.21, For even hereunto were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. Of course, the idea biblically from that verse is that we have an example of suffering, not that you're going to obtain salvation by doing what Christ did, and so that's obviously a bogus theory, but it's called the moral example theory. Then we have the necessary satisfaction theory, or it's also called the commercial theory. I'll just say commercial. And it has to do with a satisfactory payment give, being given. The writings of a theologian named An Anselm, 1033 to 1109 promoted this theory. In other words, God's justice and honor was satisfied by a penalty that only Christ could pay. God can't remit sins without compensation. That's why it's called a commercial theory or a necessary satisfaction. There has to be a payment. And so God requires the payment to be made, and that payment is made by Christ. Now, obviously, there is some truth in that. We owed a debt we could not pay and Christ paid a debt we could not owe. We sing a song like that. Then we have another theory with the word moral in it. It's called the moral influence theory. Moral influence. And the moral influence theory was uh, promoted by a theologian named Peter uh, Abelard, 1079 to 1142. And it's not saying that it's a moral example like Pelagius postulated, but he's saying that to show God's love, we have a spiritual sickness from which we can be healed because of the atonement. It really turned into the liberal view of the atonement, that God is not so much uh, a holy and just God and is going to punish sin, but that he is setting up an example similar to this, but there's an influence for us to want to love God because God loved us so much. So everybody just really falls in love with God because God is love and there is no judgment and, and justice demanded. That's called the moral influence theory.
Then we have the governmental theory. Government, governmental theory. Hugo Grotius, 1583 to 1645, promoted this. In other words, the chief aim of Christ's death is to impact a deterrent to sin. And he used the term, or the term governmental was used because of his emphasis on kind of the opposite of this one, the justice of God as far as society is concerned as well. Isaiah 42, 21, the Lord is well pleased for his righteousness sake. He will magnify the law and make it honorable. And so the idea behind the governmental theory is that you see what sin cost you. And the idea behind it in theology was also that that sin wasn't completely taken away just because you believed on Christ. There still is a debt to be paid even if after you get saved. So there's problems with the governmental theory. But it does highlight the impact of what sin will do by seeing what sin did to Jesus Christ on the cross. The atonement of sin. And here's a perfectly innocent man that dies and that's what your sin did. Then we have the mystical view. This is another liberal view promoted by uh, Frederick Schallermacher, 1768-1834. He's called the father of liberal liberalism. In other words, a change is produced in men by mystical union of God and man brought about by the incarnation. So it really gets into that allegorizing of Scripture instead of taking the Bible literally. So these are some views, and we just gave you just a small brief synopsis of these views. There are, there are or there is some truth, biblical truth, in some of these views, but it really falls short of just sticking to the Bible. Now, let's look at some Bible truths about the atonement of Jesus Christ. First word I'll put up here will be the word substitution. Substitution. And let's look at some Bible to back this up. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. You're probably familiar with this passage. 2 Corinthians 5.21 For he, referring to God, hath made him, which is Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. So the idea behind that is not just that Christ died for our sins. We know He died for our sins. But what do you mean when you say that? Well, here He died in our place. You should have been on the cross, but then Jesus goes to the cross for you. Galatians 3.13, here's another great verse on this. Galatians 3.13. Galatians 3.13. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now when Christ lived his earthly life, he was in perfect communion and fellowship with God. We know that. But we do know when he went to Gethsemane, he was... Shaken. He was emotionally shaken. He was spiritually shaken. He was physically shaken. He was sweating, as it were, dro great drops of blood, the Bible says. And the scripture tells us that it was a cold night. I mean, Peter was warming himself by the fire. There's some intense battle going on. And Jesus Christ says, not my will, but thine be done. And he keeps making reference to the cup. And we know from the Old Testament, there's mention of the cup of the wrath of God. And we know from... Passages in the Old Testament, when Christ becomes our sacrifice for us, Psalm 22, He hangs there as a curse for us. He's hanging in our place. Isaiah 53 is a great passage because it explains that He's led as a lamb to the slaughter and all we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to our own way and the Lord hath laid on Him the iniquity of our all. Our sins were transferred over to Him. So when he hangs on the cross, he hangs there not as Jesus Christ, the perfect, sinless Son of God. He hangs there as the Son of Man, 
More specifically, he hangs there as a sinner in your place. Now this explains what he says on the cross. One of the things, he says seven things. One of the things he says on the cross, and when he says that, the lights go out. Darkness falls on all the land for three hours. He's on the cross for six hours total. When he says this, the darkness goes off, the lights go off. He says, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's Psalm 22, a quotation. He never prayed to God that way any time during his life. He always said, Father, my Father, my Father. Here he says, my God. I think that's very important. Because that shows you when you read Psalm 22, as you go down through the passage, why hast thou forsaken me? He says later on, but I am a worm and no man despised of the people. He hangs there as a sinner for us. And of course the type picture that he illustrates in John chapter 3 when he talks to Nicodemus is Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. The illustration is a serpent on a pole becoming sin. Christ becoming the sacrifice. That's the next thing we want to see. It's not just a substitution, it's a sacrifice. Okay, so Jesus Christ is a sacrifice. He's the divinely instituted provision whereby sin can be covered and the liability to wrath and the curse be removed. You see, you're dealing with very specific wording and verses that are very specific because you're dealing with the most important thing in the world. That is Jesus Christ and our salvation. And so when you think about the idea of substitution, okay, he took your place, but it's not just anybody taking your place. It's Jesus Christ taking your place, a sinless man taking a sinner's place. God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Now we have the idea of sacrifice. Hebrews chapter 10, we already read that passage. But Hebrews chapter 7 verse 27, the Bible says this, Christ, referring to Christ, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. His dying on the cross is considered a sacrifice. And that idea of sacrifice goes back to the Old Testament of something having to die in place of another, like I gave you the definition for sin to be covered and the liability to the judgment and curse to be removed. There has to be a way that God can legitimately forgive the sinner. God just can't say, oh, okay, I'll just let it go. God is just. You can't have a, a penal system and a legal code in our country and just forgive debt and just forgive crimes without justice being served or you will have anarchy. There cannot be a good justice system if judgment is not enacted and justice is, doesn't come about. And so God just can't say, oh, I'm going to forgive everybody. He has to have a means by which to do so. There has to be a sacrifice and there had to be a human sacrifice. The blood of bulls and goats were no good because why? An animal is not a person. You did not evolve from a monkey, and a monkey or an animal or a sheep or an ox or a bull or a dove dying for you is not going to save you. It had to be the blood of a person, and not just any person, a sinless person, and the only way to get that is for God to become a man. Another man dying for you is no good. You say, well, what if a, a, a person died, a little baby died? What if we sacrifice babies? Babies are innocent. They may be innocent, but they're not righteous. Innocence is not righteousness. You put it to the test, eventually when the person grows up, they have a knowledge of sin and they fail the test. Jesus Christ passed the test because he was righteous and he therefore became the appropriate sacrifice. The Bible tells us that he is our Passover. 1 Corinthians 5, 7. You remember the story of the Passover lamb. Exodus chapter number 12. They had to have that lamb, the Jews did, and they had to put the blood of the lamb over the doorpost so that blood could cover them and protect them. Blood had already been shed, therefore their blood wouldn't be shed. 
I can't go to hell and pay for my sins because my sins have already been paid for by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. John 1.29, John saw Jesus coming and he said, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. He's the sacrifice. He, he's mentioned in 1 Peter 1.19, as being a lamb without blemish and without spot. Revelation 5, 6. In the midst of the elders, the Bible says, stood a lamb as it had been slain. And that's, of course, Jesus Christ. The next word we have here is ransom. Now, we saw that word when we studied the theological ideas, the ransom of atonement. And I gave you those couple of verses there. And that is a Bible word, and it is used. To ransom has to do with securing a release. And, of course, the theologians got it wrong when they think there's this thing going on between God and the devil, and he's trying to get people free, and he's paying off the devil. The devil's not that big of a, uh, a person to be paying off. Yeah, the devil's the, the foe and the fiend of Christians, and, of course, the most powerful being outside of God but when you compare him to God, he's just like a little blip. He's just a nothing. And so the idea of securing a release by the payment of a price, to be redeemed is to be delivered by the payment of a ransom. So the word redeemed is connected to the word ransom. You can't be redeemed unless there is a price to be paid. So when we talk about being redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, it carries with it the idea there's a ransom due. There is a payment, a price to be paid. So re redemption, when you study that, that presupposes some type of bondage to be enslaved, to be bound, whether it be to the debtors or to the creditors or whether it be to the master. And a slave is bound and then he is set free by way of a ransom being paid. I gave you the verse couple of verses before, I'll give you a few more. Matthew 20, verse 28, Jesus said this, Even as a Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life a ransom for many. Colossians 1, 14, In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. And I gave you 1 Timothy 2, 6, who gave Himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Also, I'll give you Titus chapter number... 2, verse number 14, Titus 2, 14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity. So that has to do with him laying down his life as a ransom for us. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12, neither by the blood of bulls and goats, excuse me, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption. He redeemed us. He paid the ransom for us. The Bible says in 1 Peter 1, 18 and 19, I gave you verse 19 earlier, but uh, he says, You were redeemed not with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. So the blood of Jesus Christ, I mean, you think about his life, obviously, as a ransom. He said that. You think about his death, obviously. He died in our place. But when you really narrow it down, you're redeemed by the blood because it is the blood that maketh atonement for the soul. And Jesus Christ's blood, Acts chapter 20, verse 28, is said to be the blood of God. That's why His blood is eternal, and that's why His blood is able to save. That's why we sing all these songs about the blood. That's why when you read the book of Revelation, they're talking about being redeemed by His blood. And there's a big deal made of His blood because that is what paid the price of your redemption. Expiation is the next word. And you don't use this word a lot in modern terms. But to expiate is to remove guilt. To remove guilt. To remove the guilt of sin by canceling and purging out. It has to do with kind of like expunging something. To take it away. It's not just to forgive. Okay, you can, you can, a uh, little kid, he spills his milk. And you can forgive him. And there it sits there. And you might not ever get it up. You might just let it dry on the table. But when the idea of expiation has to do with purging it out, removing it, cleaning it, taking it away. John 1.29, I gave you that verse. Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. Uh, 1 Peter 1, 
Uh, 1 Peter 3.18. This is a good passage. 1 Peter 3.18. Let me get to it. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just to the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. He suffered for sins, that he might bring us to God. Alright, um, Hebrews chapter 9, we gave you a couple of these verses before. Really, Hebrews 9 and 10, if you read the whole chapters, they really will clarify and help you understand the difference between Old Testament and New Testament um, salvation as it relates to this Levitical system of animals and then, of course, Christ and His sinless blood. But Hebrews chapter number 9, verse number 14, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered Himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And then in the same chapter, verse number 26, But now once in the end of the world, the middle part of the verse, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Of himself. So it has to do with taking away sin. Then we have for propitiation. Propitiation is a Bible word that's used a few times in Scripture. And we'll go to Romans chapter number 3. And you want to understand this word because it helps us to get a hold of what's taking place, not just between us and the Lord when we get saved, but what takes place between the sacrifice of Christ and God and His justice. Look in Romans chapter number 3. Look down in verse number 25. Romans 3.25, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. He's talking about Christ. He's talking about the redemption of Christ. Verse 24, a propitiation through faith in His blood to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness. Look at this. That He might be just, God, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. God has to remain God. So God can't just forgive sin without a basis by which to do so. He must punish sin justly. And that punishment must be carried out to the letter. So when Jesus Christ died, there's more going on than just this physical thing where, oh, they betrayed Him and they killed Him and He died. There's more going on because in the Garden of Gethsemane, He's praying about a cup. He's struggling about something between Him and God. He is laying down His life to God as a sacrifice for the sins of all the world. And when God sees that sacrifice, it satisfies the demands of a holy and righteous judge. The, bet, the debt's paid. It's paid in full. That word telestai, or however you pronounce it in Greek, is the word for it is finished. They use that in Bible times. They would write it is finished basically on debts that would be paid up. In other words, you, you finish paying your bill. So when he says it is finished on the cross, the payment's made. The ransom payment is made. Our redemption is complete. God is satisfied, so that word propitiation is used. It's also used in 1 John 2, 2. He is a propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And also 1 John 4, 10. He is a propitiation for our sins. The final word that we will use is reconciliation. And of course, we mentioned this in our introductory remarks about the word atonement to at one, to make two parties one, to reconcile. So that has to do with restoring us to favor with God. Uh, the cause of our alienation from God is, of course, sin. The grounds of us being alienated from God is the holiness of God. God cannot fellowship with sin. Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? But Christ's propitiatory sacrifice reconciles us to God. He grabs a hold of us by one hand because He's the Son of Man and He understands us. He's been tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He can identify with us. He grabs a hold of us. 
a cow or a goat or a dove can't identify with you, but then he can grab a hold of the hand of the God because he's a son of God. And his sinless blood sacrifice on the cross where our sins were transferred to him and he died, he paid for those sins, then he was buried and our sins were taken away. He appears again without sin. We sing that great song, uh, Living He Loved Me, Dying He Saved Me, Buried He Carried My Sins Far Away, Rising He Justified Freely Forever. One day He's coming, O oh glorious day. That has the whole gospel in it, plus the return of Christ. He lived a sinless life you couldn't live. He died a debt, death on the cross and paid a debt you could never pay because God requires holiness. He required sinless blood. You couldn't produce that. Whenever He rose again from the dead, He justified us in the sense that He was able to say, I completed everything and death could not hold me down. God promised me eternal life before the world began, just like the verse we gave you way back from Titus chapter number 1 in our study of the origin of salvation. He had that promise from God that He would rise again from the dead. He, conqu conqu he conquered sin, He conquered death, and He conquered hell and the grave. And so we have reconciliation with God. Romans chapter 5 verse 10. We're reconciled, the Bible says. We shall be saved by His life. Let's look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now I hope you're jotting these verses down. If you haven't, go back and listen to it. Write them down. Because these are foundational verses for the atonement that Jesus Christ made for us. And if you don't understand the atonement, you don't understand salvation. Now we don't understand it fully, obviously. It's a mystery. But these scriptures let us know that Christ did what He did and fulfilled the demands not to pay off the devil, but the demands of a holy God to secure our salvation for us. So when you put your faith in Christ, it is a done deal. God's already been satisfied. You don't have to try to make up for your salvation. You don't get saved and then try to live up to it and earn your way into heaven the rest of your Christian life. That's not the idea at all. The reason we do what we do is because we're saved. All right, now look in um, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. This is a great passage. Verse 14, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Come all the way down to verse number 18. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. There's a lot in that verse. In other words, you have the idea of substitution, the idea of sacrifice, the idea of ransom, the idea of expiation, all of it. Our sins have been transferred over to Christ. He died as a sacrifice. He paid the penalty to, uh, to, to re redeem us from our sins. And He's reconciled us to God. We are reconciled to God. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ now. Um, Ephesians 2.16, that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Uh, you can look up some of these verses, Colossians 1, 20 and 21. Let me give you these real quick. Colossians 1, 20 and 21. Having made peace through the blood of His cross by Him to reconcile all things unto Himself. Verse 21. And you that sometime, were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath He reconciled. You were the enemy of God, now you're the friend of God. You were away from God, now you're close to God. You were without hope and without God, now you have God. Because of the atonement of Jesus. That's all made possible because of His blood being shed in your behalf on the cross. Him dying as a sacrifice. Him atoning for your sins. It's more than just, oh, He covered it up and now you're okay and now my sins are under the blood. My sins are more than under the blood, they're gone. If they're under the blood, then if God's got to look at my sins, He's got to look through the blood. And when He looks through the blood, they're washed in the blood and I'm clean. Now, briefly, let me make this remark. And we don't have time to get into it because it's an entire another study. But if you'll go back and look at several of those verses that we gave you. 
we showed that Jesus Christ in His atonement died for the sins of all men. The idea that's uh, put forth and fostered by Calvinism teaches that Christ's atonement was a limited atonement. It only has an effect on the elect. But the Bible teaches us that Christ died for all men. Here's the problem. Calvinists believe so strongly in the sovereignty of God that they maintain that if Christ died for all to save all people, that all people would have to be saved. Because whatever God wills is going to be done regardless. That's their, one of their first mistakes. But they've invented a false dilemma here. Christ's atonement was attended, intended to provide salvation for all as well as procure salvation for all who believe. I gave you the two verses last time and the time before. Romans 3.22. It says this, Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe. Jesus Christ shed His blood for everybody, but everybody's not going to get the benefits of this. They have to believe it. They have to exercise faith in Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. I gave you several of those verses. I'm not going to give you all the whosoever verses, but several of them were in our text in this study. And His atonement's for everybody. But those of us who are saved, we're benefiting and we are reconciled. How do you know that you have eternal salvation? How can you not have eternal salvation? Because you have an eternal Savior who laid down an eternal sacrifice with eternal blood. So we have eternal life. Alright, that will include, we'll conclude our study of the atonement of Jesus Christ.